Okay, we're go we're good to go. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Um, so welcome everybody to please. I'm getting some typing feedback. All right, perfect. Um, so this is a presentation it's called Using Comics and Graphic Novels in the KTL K-12 curriculum. Um, we're gonna go over some kind of practical strategies. They're actually gonna seem probably like really like, well, that's pretty obvious um, when we get there. Um, so there's nothing that's gonna be like shockingly innovative here. Um, but sometimes I think uh, it's, we just need somebody else to kind of point out the, the easy ways that these things can be folded into our existing um, curriculum. I'm Dr. Danny Kachorsky. Uh, I teach children's analysis lit here uh, at TAMUCC. Um, I'm a comic scholar. I've been doing this for um, a long time. I'm also a former middle school and high school teacher. Um, but I've done research in elementary school classrooms, so I can also give you suggestions for um, those grade levels too. And like I said, if you have um, like particular questions about like a particular content area um, or a um, you know, particular grade level or something, you can put them into the chat and I can address them as we go. <clears throat> the one thing I will say about this presentation, this is about how to implement these into curriculum. It's not about how to teach like the conventions of comics. Um, if you are interested in like how to teach kids to read, um, I do know how to how to do that. It's a, a, that's a different presentation than I've done in the past, and I'm happy to talk with you um, about that as well. Um, just know that it's not part of of this particular presentation. All right, so we're going to start with what are comics, and before I kind of launch into the details of this, I wanted to know what do you guys think of when you think of comics? Like, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Like superheroes? Yeah, I think of superheroes. Absolutely, that's pretty common. Um, and I, I think that that is, um, for, for a lot of different reasons. Superheroes uh, were some of the first comics, right? Like, um, you know, Batman and Superman have been around since um, from kind of the start with um, action comics. Um, <clears throat> and we also have just had a lot of superhero movies in, in the past few years. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments about um, the, like the visual components, like there, there is an art part to this, right? There, it's not just words themselves. You have, there's the images that go with them. Um, and this isn't the only medium that does that. Like obviously picture books do that too. Um, film does that, memes do that. We have a lot of these um, kind of uh, texts that combine multiple modes of communication. And so comics are an example of that. Oh shoot. Um, so the first thing um, I think it's important to know about comics is that they are a medium of communication. Um, and so we have a tendency in school to think predominantly about like uh, reading and writing. We look at words. <clears throat> um, but this is another way to communicate. Um, and uh, it's actually a pretty old form of communication. Uh, comics have their origins in cave paintings and hieroglyphs. So this, um, along with oral language, is one of our first ways that we communicated with each other. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever like traveled to a foreign country, um, but if you don't know the oral language that's spoken there, you don't know the written language that's spoken there, it can be really hard to navigate. But you will understand a lot of the, the imagery or on the signs and things. Um, I managed to get around Japan pretty easily just looking at various symbols on uh, their like street signs and uh, mass transit. Um, we use them in uh, you know, the, the safety protocols and the military used to use them to show uh, soldiers how to um, you know, set up landmines and things like that. So it's a, it's a form of communication that's been around for a really long time and it has a tendency to be pretty um, accessible. <clears throat> Another thing to know about them is that comics are what we call juxtaposed sequential art. And so what that means, juxtaposed means side by side. 
right? So it means we have different images side by side with each other in a sequence to convey this information. And that's a pretty important component because it's not a single image, right? You have to make meaning from one image to the next um, as you're looking through the sequence. They're also a form of multimodal text. And what that means, multi stands for multiple and mode Modal stands for modes, and those are forms of communication. So that means that every uh, comic is going to use at least two types of um, communication. We have the image, obviously, um, which a lot of you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> but we also have the written language. Um, so if you look at the picture here, you'll see we have the, the images, we have um, the um, kind of sound effect words and the speech bubbles, and so that's image and text, but we also have color which is a mode of communication. Um, we get a lot of information based on like the red here um, as, as like a, a motive form which suggests violence and um, anger and action. Um, and there's also graphic design, which is the arrangement of all of these um, elements on the page. So we really have four different modes of communication happening on in one text right now. Um, so that makes these a pretty complicated um, resource or source of information and meaning making. They're varied in format, so um, a lot of the times when people think of comics, they think of the kind of magazine style, like the 32 page, it's um, stapled together, the, the thin kind of paper. Um, and that's one form of comics, but there's other ones too. We have, we've seen a rise in what's called the graphic novel, which is typically like a standalone um, story or a complete narrative in one piece, while a comic book is usually like a single episode or like a part of an episode and you have to read like a whole year's worth to get the whole story. Um, that isn't to say that graphic novels don't have series. They do. They kind of function the same way like a chapter book series would where you have, you know, the first book is one complete narrative and then the second book kind of follows up but is still a complete narrative. Um, there's also what we call um, comic strips or funnies, which are between two and you know, give or take 10 panels. Um, that are arranged in a sequence, they're called funnies because typically they're comedic in some way. Um, we've got an example of Spy versus Spy up there, which is a classic one. And then we also have digital formats now. Um, so there's digital formats where it's basically like a scanned page and you just kind of flip through your app. Um, but there's also motion books, which add animation and sound effects. There's um, motion comics, which are sort of like an animated um, short film, but it's a little more one dimensional or sorry, two-dimensional, and then um, we have the, the guided view, which I'll talk about a little bit later. They're also varied in genre. Sometimes people talk about graphic novels as if they are a genre in and of themselves, but they're, they're format, which means that we can have so many different genres that are executed using this medium. Um, so there, is, there are fiction, there are nonfiction, and within uh, fiction there are you know, realistic fiction, historical fiction, science fiction, fantasy, it's, you know, it's got all of them. Um, within the nonfiction genres, you know, we have a lot of memoirs and biographies, but we also have other informational texts um, that are kind of like I'm more of a how-to um, source of genre. <clears throat> and then they're very popular reading material. Um, while um, sales, uh, the statistics for sales for, um, Traditional print books have gone down um, like 1% steadily over the past few years. Uh, comics and graphic novels have been rising at about like 7 or 8% every year. So this is one of the most popular forms of reading that's happening um, these days. So because they're so popular, it means your students are already using them. Um, so why not capitalize on that? All right, so why use comics? There's a lot of reasons. Um, and it's all based on research. So one of the things that we found with um, comics and graphic novels is that they're highly motivating and interesting to our students. Um, they're, and they're interesting across um, ages and grade levels um, and, and genders and other demographics, right? Um, uh, when it, we first started researching comics back in the 90s, um, they were typically shown to uh, highly motivate reluctant readers and boys, but in um, recent years, in the past 10 years or so, um, it's uh, 
middle grade and upper elementary girls are the most um, common readers of graphic novels. So these are highly interesting and motivating to um, all of our students. Um, well, I shouldn't say all, of them. there's always gonna be that one student that doesn't like the thing, right? Um, I had one high school girl who did not like uh, anything visual. She only wanted to read traditional books. So there's always gonna be the exception to the rule. Um, we found that they're very useful in teaching traditional literacy. Um, Comics are a form of literature, just like um, any other form of literature. They're going to have all of the things that make literature. So plot, character, setting, um, literary elements. And so you can use these as a, you can swap them in for your more traditional like chapter books or short stories um, and do all the same things that you would do with your literature oriented ELAR standards if you're in an ELAR classroom. <clears throat> They're also useful in conveying content knowledge for different subject areas. Um, research has found that students are, are uh, one, more likely to read content area information if it's presented in content for, or comic form, but they're more likely to retain it as well because they're using multiple modes of communication to learn the content. So they get the text, but they also get the pictures. They can be useful for content area literacy, which is a little different than content area knowledge. Um, content area literacy is the, the ways of reading that are unique to a particular content area. So with um, math, we might look at, um, you know, charts and graphs. Um, with, with science, we might look at, like, processing, um, you know, before and after um, kind of schematics. Um, with, you know, history, we might be looking a lot at, um, you know, primary sources. And so these, uh, this medium will incorporate a lot of those tools within the text itself. So if you're reading a science comic, for example, and a science researcher is giving a presentation um, based on mathematical data, the presentation will be behind them and you can um, teach your kids how to read the graphs by looking at an existing graph within the story. They're also very useful for visual literacy, which is a type of literacy that's gaining a lot of momentum our kids live in a very visual world. We have, you know, websites, memes, um, uh, social media, all of these things, and they're all um, multimodal and visual in nature. And since comics and graphic novels are also visual and multimodal in nature, they we can focus on um, those strategies with comics or graphic novels, and then uh, they can be applied then to other mediums that kids experience. Um, throughout their daily lives. They're fantastic for critical literacy. One of the really interesting things, especially with um, like history oriented comics or social studies oriented comics is that we get a lot of um, uh, perspectives that are not typically um, addressed in maybe our, our textbooks. Um, so we get to look at um, you know, different perspectives um, for a particular time period. So, for example, during World War I, there was a, uh, a, a unit um, that was all African-American um, soldiers. There is a graphic novel about that called Harlem Hellfire. And um, so it'll, it'll focus in on a particular group um, during a time period where typically the, the textbook would ignore um, those individuals. And then finally, um, it's a form of assessment. We can, we can have kids, um, represent their learning and represent um, various skills. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about those um, as we move on to talk about how we can actually use these in the class. Okay. I saw a couple of things pop up in the chat. Lauren, was there any questions? Uh, Deborah was saying, uh, comics and graphic novels seem more obviously integrated with other disciplines, don't they? as well as seeing things from up and down on the page, as well as left to right. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that because sometimes it's not quite as simple as up and down and left and right. Um, every once in a while we get like a, a an artist that likes to do fun things, um, which can really throw people off. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna focus on four different ways that you can uh, include comics in your curriculum. Um, probably the most obvious way is just to use them to convey content. Um, and so this is going to seem kind of obvious. 
to, to everyone, but it, pick a topical content standard, a topic in your curriculum, or maybe even a focal text. Um, and then just Google that topic alongside the words comic, comic strip, graphic novel, whatever the case may be. Um, not every topic is going to have a graphic novel or comic, but a lot of them will, and some of them will have many. So if you're thinking about doing Romeo and Juliet in the classroom, there's like there's at least six, maybe up to ten versions of graphic novels for Romeo and Juliet. So you can kind of have your pick. Um, science has as quite a few. There's several science comic series that um, where there's individual comics that deal with specific topics, like particular animals or um, you know particular things like the water cycle, the digestive system, like those sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, just do a little exploring. Um, once you find some stuff, you know, take a look at it, preview it. Um, one of the things about adding the visual element to any text um, is that what may be considered like appropriate for a particular age group um, becomes like a different type of consideration, especially with the high school oriented comics. They do have a tendency to be more visually graphic. Um, so, for example, that when I was talking about earlier, Harlem Hellfighters, which is about World War One, it's very violent and there's a lot of blood, um, which so may, may not be appropriate for your middle grades classroom, um, but your your high school group might be able to handle that. So it's important to look at these things before just launching into them in your classroom. But once you find something that fits that particular content, you can just swap it in. So instead of doing like a lesson from your textbook or giving a lecture or some kind of direct instruction, um, you can read the comic and use that as the, the delivery system instead of whatever it was you were originally going to do. <clears throat> so that one's pretty easy, straightforward, um, obvious. Another way that you can um, use these is to enhance any content area uh, teaching that you're doing. Uh, so think about the topics, the content, the themes that you're, you're going to address in your curriculum. Um, like if you're in English language arts, like we have a tendency to do a lot of thematic units. So like maybe we're going to do a unit on family and friendship. Um, you, know, you, can, you can pull from a, a wide range of texts if you want to hit on those themes. Um, I know we have somebody who is uh, in art in this classroom. So they, there's a lot of different art styles. So if you are, I don't know, focus on a particular um, like medium certain um, Gareth Hines is a graphic novel artist who only uses watercolor. Um, so if you're doing you know on a, a lesson on a particular medium, that can be a really good example um, of how and that can be used in um, these really massive large. I mean his books are this thick; they're huge. Um, same thing is with the uh, conveying content recommendation. Google it and you know see what's out there. Um, take a look at these texts and make sure that they're appropriate for your age group. Um, and then you can read these alongside your instruction. So you might break uh, the graphic novel or comic into smaller sections and use it to introduce like sub concepts while you're teaching. You can have kids read it as a um, you know, as homework um, to enhance what you're doing and then reference the graphic novel um, while you're um, you know, giving that direct instruction or um, when a kid gets confused during uh, like a later stage in a project, you can reference an event from a book um, to help contextualize it for them. So, for example, um, I worked with a high school teacher who was doing a unit on um, food insecurity um, and talking about you know, like the, the social political aspects of that, as well as like the, the scientific reasons for food insecurities across the world. And we, he selected this book, hashtag food crisis, which is a graphic novel. The first half is a, is a fictional dystopian story and the second half is a series of essays. Um, but he had the kids read this while he was teaching and it wasn't a big part of, of the unit, but when he came to new concepts that he was addressing on a particular day, um, he would uh, reference events that happened in the book. So it's like, all right, so remember how in hashtag food crisis, when they ran out of food, they had this riot. So you know, this is this connects to this idea in that way. That would help the kids kind of understand the concepts that he was addressing. <clears throat> you can also use the skills. Um, there's a lot of different you can use these for. I only have a few on here. Um, so if there's a particular skill that you're curious about, we can we can talk about it. 
Um, but they're particularly good for teaching inferencing. Inferencing is like the number one thing that students seem to have issues with, especially on standardized tests. Um, but by virtue of being sequential art, by having one panel next to another panel, you have to infer and move from one panel to the next panel and understand what's happening. So for example, if you had a picture of a character who's about to hit a baseball, and like the first picture is them holding the bat up, and then the second picture is the bat hitting the ball. You're not seeing the swing happen. Right? These are standalone images, but you are inferring that the character has gone from holding the bat up, swinging the bat to hitting the ball, right? Um, and that seems like a pretty straightforward inference, right? But they're not always that easy. Um, a ball for Daisy, which is the example I have here on the slide, is a, a, a wordless um, comic in a, in a picture book form. And in this story, Daisy is a dog, she has a ball, it's her favorite thing. Um, the, the ball goes over a fence, it gets popped, and then she's sad. It's a very simple concept. It's intended for, um, you know, like a kindergarten, kind of first grade, even preschool audience. Um, the, what, how the ball gets popped isn't clear. How it gets over the fence isn't clear. There's a lot of assumptions that you can make. You can assume that it got kicked over, that it bounced over. Um, that it ran into the fence and that's how it got popped, that it ran into a twig and that's how it got popped. And all of those things are possibilities, but it's not explicit. And so you can have kids read these things, have them summarize what they think is going on, compare those assumptions that they're making, um, and then discuss and justify their answers because they're gonna have different assumptions, they're gonna have different inferences. Um, and having those discussions about where they're pulling the information from, are you getting it from the images? Are you getting it from your own experience? Those um, will show them how inferencing works, number one, and will also help them, like if they have to go do that on an exam, like, all right, so I know that when I'm inferencing, I can look for evidence in the text to support my inference, but I can also think about my real world experiences to build my conclusion. <clears throat> By virtue of being sequential art, um, this is an excellent uh, tool for students to demonstrate their understanding of sequence. Right? In the early grades, we have a, a, a lot of standards that are related to you know, beginning, middle, end, you know, first, second, third kind of a thing. Um, so you can, you can cut up these sequences and have kids reorder them to see how the different pieces connect and make a logical order. Um, you can have kids draw their own sequences. Um, to demonstrate, well, oh, okay, I understand that this is the first part of the story, the middle part of the story, the end part of the story. Um, and thinking about maybe, um, you know, the science with like a, a lab report um, where it's like, this is the first thing you have to do, the second thing that you have to do, kids can draw those out to represent what they actually did um, to demonstrate their process. <clears throat> so anything that has some kind of sequencing components can, can be very useful either for reading comics or making their own. All right, finally, um, another really easy kind of practical way to bring these into the classroom is to use them as a form of assessment. Um, so you can identify a learning outcome for a unit or a lesson that can be represented either visually or sequentially. Um, anything that can be represented visually or sequentially, you can use a comic um, to represent. <clears throat> so, you know, if you're, um, you know, wanting to do a summary, right? The summary usually kind of like shows, you know, what happens at the beginning of the book or the um, paragraph and uh, all the way to the end with the details in between. And so that if, if you can represent that visually, you can do that kind of a, a visual summary. Uh, I mentioned lab uh, laboratory writing before. You can also create original works. Um, so like one of the standards I know is like uh, kids need to be able to show that they understand foreshadowing um, and so they can uh, draw that out for you to demonstrate that they understand it. Um, one thing, any time that you start doing something artistic that involves drawing, um, think about the time limits that you have. Um, this is going to take more time than maybe writing like a quick paragraph or something like that. Um, and the higher quality product that you want, the more time you're gonna have to give students. Um, so think about the time that you have set limit, like maybe you only want them to do three panels versus, you know, five pages. One is definitely going to take longer than the other. Another option is to think about this as a thing that you do as a term of preparation. 
Um, there is most comics and graphic novels are not made by one person. There are a few people who are incredibly talented who do these things um, on their own. But most of the time there's a, a somebody who sketches, there's somebody who does the, um, the coloring, there's somebody who does the lettering, there's somebody who plans out the content and the dialogue. Um, at minimum, there's usually, you know, four people who produce a comic. At maximum, you'll sometimes see teams of 30, right? So you can build small collaborative teams in your classroom based on student skill. Like if you have students that really enjoy, um, you know, the illustrative aspect of it, if you have kids that are much better about thinking about the, um, like the structure of the content. Um, some kids are just have really excellent handwriting, so that's what they want to do. You know, you can build them um, in these these uh, uh, heterogeneous groups based on their skills to produce these things. <clears throat> and the other thing I would say is that you probably you always want to talk to kids about what they've made. Um, certainly, there are certain assessments that you can do where it's going to be pretty obvious, and it's like a checkbox. Like, all right, I want you to you know show me that you understood beginning, middle, and end. Um, and they can do like a picture from the beginning, a picture from the middle, a picture from the end. But um, when you're getting into more, um, you know, higher level kinds of things, like if the if the goal was to convey, um, you know, some kind of information, you know, for another student to read, it's important to have conversations with students about what they're doing, because um, sometimes the the thinking that goes behind the design is going to be more illustrative of their learning than the actual product. Um, so, if, if a student is purposely using, you know, particular, um, like, arrangement on a page or a particular art style to generate a feeling in the reader, that's more important to know than whether or not it got you there as the reader, right? Um, so, thinking about their process um, and having them talk to you about their process and their learning is um, as important, if not more important, than the actual process. All right, so what happens then if kids don't get it? Because inevitably there's, there's always that issue, right? Um, the first thing I would say is just don't make any assumptions when it comes to comics and graphic novels. Um, those of us who have been doing this for a while have a tendency to think that the, the newer generations are going to get um, the things that are less familiar to us. So they're, they're going to be good at the technology. They're going to understand how to read the um, because they're more prevalent in their daily lives. That's not necessarily the case. Um, the first time I ever used graphic novels in my classroom, um, I was using Fahrenheit 451, the graphic adaptation, and they had no idea what was going on. It took them, like, it took me like two chapters to kind of figure out that they weren't looking at pictures. Um, we have a tendency to train kids out of looking at the images um, as they get higher and higher in school. For my, for those of you who are working with the lower grades, you'll, you know, early elementary, they haven't gotten there yet. But if you're working with high school, you might have to get them to start looking again. Like my students were only reading the words and they weren't looking at pictures at all. Um, and you do need both um, in order to understand this, this format. <clears throat> so when stuff like that happens, or even to kind of like head it off at the pass, you can always start with the wordless comics and graphic novels. Um, get them to look back at pictures. And, what they're seeing, um, kind of a deep dive into images um, so that they can start thinking about the sequencing and how, the, their, how they're inferencing between the different images before you add the words back in. You can also spend some time exploring the different conventions. There are certain things that comics do that other mediums don't. There's speech bubbles, for example. Um, they have the white space between the different panels. Those are called gutters, and there's six different types of gutters. So there's different types of inferencing that you do between um, a gutter that transitions you from one scene to another than the type of inferencing that you do from um, like an action to action sequence. Um, so you can you know, teach those conventions specifically or you can explore them, you can define these things, you can talk about how they work. Um, Deborah this says- is just kind of uh, Deborah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay. Deborah says, it seems like Close reading of comics is every bit of a cognitive load as reading in a positive way. In other words, it develops thinking. Yes. Yeah. They, um, they're like, I mean, like any other kind of um, 
multimodal test or, or you know, anything that's going to require you to look across different modes. It's, I would say they're actually a little more complicated than just single mode um, documents. So like it does, it takes more cognitive work to take two different modes of communication or more and combine it um, to make meaning than it does to take a single one. Um, and so that's one of the things when I talk about don't make assumptions, don't assume that this is going to be easy. And uh, that that high interest, that motivational aspect is going to maybe make it seem like it is easy. But I mean, I've seen plenty of adults who try to sit down with a comic or a graphic novel for the first time are like, I have no idea what's happening here. But again, it's because we kind of we work really hard to get kids to start paying attention to words. Um, but our world today is so visually oriented, it's so multimodal. That we're in a way kind of doing kids a disservice by teaching them to stop looking. Um, and it ends up making that kind of uh, reading and learning a little more complex for them. So to a point that Debbie made a lot earlier, um, the, the top down or the top to bottom, the left to right, um, not all comics work that way. Um, most of the simpler especially in the early grades reading that you'll find will do that. Like they, you know, they kind of follow the same conventions as print. You're gonna start on the top left and work your way down the page in a zigzag format. Um, but um, that's not always the case. And certain illustrators um, like to do fun and crazy things. Uh, so certain artists have rep reputations for doing stuff that's a little odd. Um, and then if you're looking at Japanese comics or manga, they start on the right, and work to the left, and they also have a tendency to go from, you know, top down and then zig and then come from top down again. Uh, so sometimes it's going to take like a few pages to really get into the swing of a particular comic. Um, so you can spend some time like looking at different layouts and, you know, thinking about as a class, like, how would you go about this? And how would you approach that? And you know, like the size of a panel can indicate that you're supposed to pay attention to that first. Um, so there's a lot of various kind of conditions that get thrown at kids and at adults when they read these. Um, another thing you can do if you're having a really hard time with something is just go digital. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's this feature called guided view with digital comics. Um, and it's a button that you hit on the device and it makes it so that you only look at one panel at a time. Um, so if you have a reader who gets really distracted, this can be helpful in kind of focusing their attention. Um, if you have a, a reader who's like not looking or spending a lot of time on uh, individual images because they're just like looking all over the page, this can help them focus. Uh, it also zooms in so you can see more detail in, a, in the smaller um, panels. So this can be a really useful tool um, if your kids are struggling to kind of focus on, on the medium. All right, that is it for the slideshow. And I've been talking for a while. So what questions, comments, concerns do we have? Uh, Deborah just chatted. She says, uh, I could promote a productive discussion as well since the dependency on readings com reading comprehension associated with pure text novels is not there to get in the way. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that, Debbie? I'm not sure I'm following. <clears throat> So I'm imagining a situation where um, students are trying to figure out uh, what the pages are trying to tell them. I guess that's the way to put it. And um, in my experience with math, uh, when kids can draw and point to things that they notice about other people's thinking, it promotes this sort of collaborative discussion because everybody's looking at the same part. So I can imagine uh, reading about, say, the Civil War, Civil Rights era, and then there's things on the page that maybe you're struggling with because it's not in the order that you're used to, but that sort of creates a natural venue for talking about the meaning of uh, what the the book is trying to show you, um, rather than uh, depending on people reading you know, the text thoroughly and being able to justify their thinking, they can point to parts and say, see here, this is, um, this guy looks angry. So, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine, but I just, right, like, it's like that. 
Um, I, I think the, the thing is, is that you're still justifying your thinking. It's just that you're different using a different resource to justify that thinking. Right? So, um, if you're, if you're saying this guy looks angry, you're reading the body posture, their facial expressions, Um, and that's 1 of the things about a visual medium that is particularly powerful. It's like, you don't have to just rely on the words that are being said. Um, because a lot of times with written word, we don't have the things of, that come with like tone. Right, that we would get from oral language and visual. Um, the, the visual components of like the facial expressions, the body posture of the characters, even the fonts that are used, like the bolding of a font, the color of a font can indicate those more emotive things. So it gives you a lot more tools right. um, to, uh, to make your arguments than just text. Right, and so it would include kids who, so you, now you can talk about the content that you intended them to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. more <laughs> avenues for people to be engaged is kind of what I was saying. Yeah, great. Danny, I have a question for you. This is Michelle. Yeah. Um, okay. I the chat that I want to address after that. Okay. So when I taught ESL students um, at the middle school and the high school level, we had books available to us, graphic novels at different levels for students who were reading at beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels of learning. What is your opinion on those graphic novels? And do you have any um, experience with those with how well they were written? Okay. So there's um, the first thing I'll say is that there's different series and not all series are created equal. Right? So there's some of these that are, are really well done and there's some of them that are pretty terribly done. Um, not from, uh, like a text. Um, perspective, so, like, there's a series of, um. They're called graphic adaptations and they have them where, like, there's Romeo and Juliet and there's 3 different versions of Romeo and Juliet. The most advanced 1 uses Shakespeare's actual language. The, um, the low, I, I don't like the word lowest, but like the, you know, it's the, the lower reading level 1 is in more traditional English and it uses like lower vocabulary. Like, it, um, so it's not quite as highfalutin. Um, and then there's 1. It's, um, very well scaffolded from a visual. It's some of the worst illustrations I've ever seen in my life. So if you're thinking in terms of like a, a high quality overall, um, they're not intended as, um, you know, as a, as a, a piece of art, as a, as a graphic novel or comic, this is an instructional tool. Um, and, you know, they, they serve a purpose and they can be really useful. I would suggest with like a, with an English with a, sorry, uh, like an ESL group. Or an ELL group, um, finding more um, authentic texts um, that are uh, for for graphic novels and comics because they're still going to they're going to use language um, in a way that is the way we would really use it. Um, you know, it's going to reference speech patterns. It's going to be written um, in you know mostly grammatically correct ways. There's also a lot of characters who don't um, who are English language learners themselves, so kids can see themselves in the text um, and watch as those uh, characters become more fluent in the new language as well. Um, so they, you know, there's some benefits to them, but you know, from from like an overall production standpoint, they're not the most interesting. Yeah. Thank you. We have three right, so pretty got, closely okay. related questions here in the chat. Um, there's one about uh, uh, they would like to know where some free comic resources are for students online. And then uh, somebody else asks, uh, are there free apps or websites uh, that students can use to create their own comic panels? And then the other related one is um, what are your favorite websites or apps? Um, those are the um, three ones. OK, so yes, there are there are some free things. Um, that you can use. The 1 thing I will say, though, about the free stuff is it's usually the least well produced stuff. Right? Um, so keep keep that in mind. Um, if you're looking for high quality things, you're probably going to have to pay a little bit. That being said, um, in terms of apps for reading comics, um, is it. You know, Marvel has has an app. there's comicsology that has an app. There's something called made fire. 
M A D E and then fire. Um, and they're what they do a lot of the time is like the first couple of issues of a title will be free. And that's, you know, that's intended to kind of get you um, hooked, I guess. Um, so if, if you're looking to kind of just introduce these and have them available, there, there's options, right? Um, certain um, at the higher, like higher grade levels, there's certain um, websites, like there's the World of Viruses, which is produced by, I want to say it's a university in Georgia. Um, and they have free comics that are about viruses and they're pretty well produced, but they also had a lot of money to make them, right? Um, the university gave them a grant. Um, so there's some, you know, sometimes you have to do a little hunting. Um, there are some free websites, but then there's also the ones where there's like a free, there's like a free version of it and then for making comics, but then there's also like, if you pay for it, you get like, um, like a more robust kind of, Service and one of the documents that I shared with you, um, the article called "Valuing the Visual," has a list of some of those apps for making comics. Um, let's see, I'm blanking on the names of some of them right now, but give me just a second. That's really laggy. Um, but there's like something called Webtoons, um, Pixton, P-I-X-T-O-N um, is really nice. Um, it gives you like pre-generated backgrounds. You can also design your own stuff as well. Um, but again, that's one of those ones where there's like a free version, but there's also you want to get all the tools, um, you have to, you know, have your, you have to pay for it or you have to have your school pay for it. The one thing with Pixton is it does kind of like the Google Classroom. Um, you can have like your whole class have an account if you pay for it. <clears throat> so it's designed for teaching and learning. Uh, let's see. I think I missed a few things. Uh, Princess says uh, I often use wordless picture books to help my students learn inferencing by the filling in the blanks. <laughs> Uh, they understand this more quickly than trying to teach inferencing first from text. So that's a comment. Absolutely. And then uh, Valerie says, I love your idea of having students create a comic strip on an assessment. I'm going to implement that in my next observed lesson over force. Oh, that'll be a good one. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's a really excellent one. And I've got, there's a, a series that's not comics per se, but for physics. Um, Chris Ferry writes these um, like different books for babies. So there's like quantum physics for babies, rocket science for babies. Um, and in terms of like showing these uh, physics elements visually, they're fantastic examples. Um, so, I mean, they're little board books, but they're, I mean, the same kind of sequential premises apply and you can like, you could copy the pages. And, and put your earmuffs, Lauren, because I'm going to talk about breaking copyright law. You can make a couple of co you know copies. It's fair um, use. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a really great idea. Yeah. Um, one more question. Oh, go ahead. Somebody. You said it was physics for babies. Those were what the books were called in quantum, something like that. Yeah. So there's like quantum physics for babies, rocket science for babies. I mean, he's got a whole series. Um, it's just a bunch of them. It, yeah. It's okay. like Chris and then. I forget how you spell his last name, but it's like Frere, like F-R-I-E-R-R-E. -R -R -E. um, if you get something close to that, he'll pop up. He is a physicist out of uh, Australia. He just wrote a book about the about pandemics too, so that's fun. <laughs> Did we have one final question in the chat, Lauren? I knew you were about to say something before, Gabby. Yes, we we sure did. Uh, this is from Gabby. Any book suggestions for lower elementary students, K through third? Yeah, so one of the documents that I shared with you has some of my favorites in it. There's also some, some links to um, various lists and websites. Um, for really early, um, like elementary, like K, you know, kindergarten, first, uh, you know, pre-K, there's a lot of the, the wordless ones, um, which, I mean, you can still use these in upper and upper grade levels, but like a ball for daisies, fantastic. There's a snowman, 
Um, that's pretty good. Um, you know, Little Robot is is a fantastic one, um, and is also you know features diverse characters. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot out there. You if you like Google comics or graphic novels for um, elementary, like the, there's so many lists on the internet. Um, so just do some exploring, see what's there. Um, I'm my probably my favorite is uh, Narwhal Unicorn of the Sea, which is one of the characters that you've seen kind of throughout. Um, and it's one, it's adorable, two, it's funny, um, but it also uses things like line and color in really unique ways. So it's a good starter comic for kids. All right, so well, we have like three minutes left. <laughs> so any I, other questions? Back to the staring awkwardly part of the, the session. I, I I loved your presentation. I thought it was really informative. I have way too many questions, and I know you, so I can ask you later. I want to give everyone else a chance. No problem. <clears throat> You're welcome, Gabby. Anything for you? Princess, could you expand on your question? You just have copyright question mark in the chat. Is there yes. something specific? She was about to say something about copyright and then she got sidetracked and I was very interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, with, with anything that you use in a classroom, um, you, I mean, you have to think about like copyright law, right? As like how much you can reproduce. Um, I think it's maybe more of an issue for us at the university level because in the elementary level, like free use covers you pretty well. Like you can you can kind of reproduce things as long as it's intended for educational purposes, right? Um, Lauren knows a little bit more about this, I think, than I do. Um, and I do play a little fast and loose with the rules sometimes um, if I'm trying to demonstrate something for my children's like groups. Um, so yeah, you can. Um... Just as a heads up, you can Google if you're ever concerned, like, oh, should I be doing this? Shouldn't shouldn't I be doing this? There's like a copyright or sorry, not a copyright, a fair use checklist um, that you can Google. It's free to use. It's from some library at some university somewhere. I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but uh, <laughs> if you look it up, it it literally says like, I am doing this, I am doing this, and you put a checkbox next to whatever you're doing, and if you equal a certain score, it's like, oh, that's danger zone. And then if you don't mm -hmm. equal it, it's like, oh, that's probably fair use. So uh, you can you can be more um, aware that way. And they've gotten things have gotten a little, I don't want to say laxer, but maybe a little more flexible in the the era of the pandemic. Um, like a lot of publishing companies have um, put like kind of guidelines in place for like, while this is going on, you can do these things with our product. Um, each co publishing company is a little bit different. Um, but if you Google like, um, you know, like read aloud permissions publishing, um, you'll you'll be able to find kind of a list of all the things that you're now allowed to do um, with various publishing companies books. All right, folks, so that is time. So if you need to get on to another presentation, feel free if you have a question that you didn't want to ask. With all the people here, that's fine. Hang out. I'll stay for a minute and answer whatever questions you have. Bye, Michaela. Good to see you. Bye, Valerie. Bye, Cassie. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Gabby. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>